Hi there, I'm Sawyer. Welcome to Real Numbers, the weekly show that solves math problems motivated by real-world situations. Well, most weeks we consider real-world situations. This week we are solving a virtual-world situation of running into an unknown bad guy in a video game. Okay, so where should we drop? You are exploring a haunted forest in a video game. The monsters in the haunted forest are of three difficulty classes, each equally likely to be encountered. Timid, aggressive, and deadly. When a timid monster attacks, it deals between one and six damage uniformly. That is, each outcome has equal probability, one-sixth in this case. An aggressive monster deals between one and 12 damage uniformly, and a deadly monster deals between one and 20 damage uniformly. However, the different difficulty class monsters all look identical. You enter a clearing in the haunted forest, and a monster of unknown difficulty class attacks you. On average, how much damage will this attack deal? And a bonus question. Let's say this very monster deals four damage with its first attack. On average, how much damage will a second attack from the same monster deal? To solve the problem of the week, we need to understand what it's asking. In particular, the first two words, on average. The mathematical concept behind these words is expected value, a sort of probabilistic average. In case you are not already familiar with this concept, let's cover its definition and a small example. We know what an average of a set of n values is. It's the sum of the values divided by n. For example, the average of these three die rolls is 11 thirds. 1 plus 5 plus 5 divided by 3. We can rewrite this as 1 third times 1 plus 1 third times 5 plus 1 third times 5, and instead think of the average of three values as the weighted sum of the values, where the weights are all equal and add up to 1. Now, if you have a probabilistic process that generates a value, its expected value is the average of all possible outcomes, with each outcome weighted by its probability of occurring. So the definition of the expected value of a random variable is the sum over all possible values that variable takes on times the probability that it takes on that value. Notice that once again the weights will add up to 1 because the sum of the probabilities of all possible outcomes is 1, but now they don't have to all be equal. Let's look at an example. We just took the average of a set of three known die rolls but because a die roll is a probabilistic process that outputs a value, we can compute the expected value of a single die roll. We compute it by summing up these values weighted by, so multiplied by, their probabilities of occurring. In this case, each weight is 1 sixth, and the outcomes are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And so the expected value is 21 over 6, or 7 over 2. Note that the expected value is not a possible outcome, you never roll a three and a half with a six-sided die. But the number that best summarizes the set of outcomes is 3.5. There are several ways to make this mathematically precise, which we will cover in future episodes. Okay, try to determine the expected value of the damage dealt by a monster coming from the haunted forest and submit your solution with work shown on this page. Now we'll solve the problem from last week's episode. If you'd like to see that episode, there's a link in the video description. We were finding the tallest painting that one could slide through a window of a particular shape. It was a square window with side length 1 meter, except its top edge was replaced with a semicircle that had that edge as a diameter. Because all the paintings were wider than they are tall, the best orientation to fit them through the window is with their width perpendicular to the plane of the window. This means the height of the painting will intersect the window as a line segment. So the question boils down to, what is the longest line segment that can fit inside the shape of the window? It's easy to come up with a few lower bounds on the answer by finding the lengths of the line segments that do fit in the window. For example, the square root of 2 is the length of the diagonal of the square, so that's a lower bound, equal to approximately 1.414. But 1.5 is a better lower bound. That's the height of the window, since we know that the radius of the circle must be half a meter. We can do even better than this 1.5 by swinging this line segment over to the corner of the window like so. The distance of this diagonal can then be found using the Pythagorean theorem. It's the square root of 1 half squared plus 3 half squared. That's the square root of 5 halves, which is approximately 1.581. 
Is this the best we can do? Turns out, no. We can reason about the tangent lines to the semicircle to find the longest line segment. The tangent line gives the best linear approximation to a curve at a point. So moving a tiny amount along the curve at that point is very similar to moving along the tangent line by the same amount. As a researcher at Jane Street, these locally linear approximations come in handy when considering the effects of small changes to the inputs or coefficients of mathematical models. Let's label the endpoints of this line segment A at the bottom left corner of the window, and B at the top of the window, and let's focus on B. We know that the tangent line to the boundary of the window is flat at its maximal point, so sliding B along the curve to the right will increase the length of the AB. In fact, we want to keep sliding this point to the right along the edge of the window until the tangent line to the curve at B is perpendicular to AB. So where is the point that makes AB perpendicular to the tangent of the semicircle? Let's consider a general circle. Starting at any point on the circle, a perpendicular line to the tangent at that point splits the circle exactly in two, and so in particular it goes through the center of the circle. Therefore, we want to pick B such that the center of the circle that coincides with the top boundary of the window lies on the line segment AB. That center, O, is easy to find. It's the midpoint of the diameter that's the top edge of the square. So if we choose B correctly, the length of AB is just the length of AO plus the length of OB. OB is a radius of the circle, so is 1 half. AO can be found with the Pythagorean theorem. The square root of 1 half squared plus 1 squared, or the square root of 5 over 2. So the length of the maximal line segment is the sum 1 half plus the square root of 5 over 2, or 1 plus the square root of 5 all over 2, that's 1.618. Wait a minute! That's phi, or phi, the golden ratio, the divine proportion, the positive solution to x equals 1 plus 1 over x. Who ordered that? When a solution to a complicated math problem simplifies down to a nice answer, it suggests that there's a clever principle at work, and a simpler solution is possible. But when a math problem spits out the golden ratio as the answer, it's practically screaming that something cool is going on under the surface. So when I solved this problem and got phi, I immediately started looking for such a reason. The relevant geometrical principle turns out to be the power of a point theorem, due to esteemed geometer Jakob Steiner of the 1800s. The power of a point says, given a circle and a point P not on that circle, if you draw a line through the point that intersects the circle at two points A and B, the product of the distances AP and BP does not depend on the line. That is, if you pick two different lines through P, both intersecting the circle in two places, then the products of the distances from those two places are equal. Okay, so what does this have to do with windows and paintings? Well, the top of our window is a circle, so we can start there. As we sweep our point B across the top of the window, we know that the product of the length of AB with AC, the other point of intersection, remains constant. If we sweep B to the left, both AB and AC approach the left side of the window, which has side length 1. That means these products must equal 1 times 1, which is 1. Now, if we sweep B back to the right, we want to find the point that maximizes the distance AB. Well, because AB times AC is constant, this point must simultaneously minimize AC. This implies the point B should be selected to maximize BC, which would make BC the diameter of the circle, so have distance 1. Therefore, the maximal distance AB equals AC plus BC satisfies AB equals AC plus 1 and AB times AC equals 1. Therefore, AB equals 1 plus 1 over AB, and we see the equation that is solved by the golden ratio. So cool! Alright, back to the problem posed this week, where we are changing our focus from geometry to the statistical concept of expected value. You encounter an enemy in a video game that has a one-third probability to be timid, aggressive, or dangerous. Timid monsters deal 1 to 6 damage uniformly, while aggressive monsters deal 1 to 12, and dangerous monsters deal 1 to 20. What is the expected value of the damage dealt by this monster's first attack? As a bonus question, given that this monster's first attack deals 4 damage, what is the expected value of its second attack? 
Submit your solutions below, and I'll see you next time on Real Numbers.